for being here. Uh, I'm happy to be here and tell you about some work that actually began about two years ago uh, while uh, uh, most of the co-authors were at the Simons Institute uh, at Berkeley, and so this is joint work with a uh, collaborator, uh, Yu Xia, who's in the audience here, as well as uh, Kyle, uh, who's at Cornell, and then uh, our advisors, Don Song at Berkeley and Elaine Shi at Cornell. Uh, and I should say, I'm a newly minted faculty member at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the Security and Privacy Research Group, and also an associate director of the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Contracts. Uh, so we are right in the middle of the, the blockchain session as well as the blockchain era. Some call it a bubble, I call it the blockchain era. This is kind of the obligatory slide to impress upon you how much interest there is in blockchains and consensus protocols and the like uh, recently. Now, even though these are inspired by Bitcoin, and Bitcoin and several other open cryptocurrencies have been big successes, we don't know in general how to just launch a new uh, uh, public open blockchain and get it to work. So a lot of the interest from industry is in something maybe a little more modest, which is the permission ledger setting, which is the traditional distributed consensus setting, where we can assume that we can choose which nodes are going to participate. So we'll have n nodes. They all know about each other um, as a setup. And the good thing about this setting is that this is the, the standard setting, so we have more than 30 years of knowledge about how to design these protocols and so a large body of work to choose from. Although surprisingly, all of the uh, uh, companies that we see developing consensus protocols uh, show fairly low diversity in the protocols they choose. In particular, most of them are based on PBFT in particular, which is a fairly ancient, uh, by these standards, uh, uh, consensus protocol. Now, if you look at uh, roughly the protocols that we know and try to categorize them, the main ways to break down uh, your, your fault-tolerant protocols are by a couple of these dimensions uh, describing the assumptions that they rely on. So we have the kinds of fault models, whether they tolerate crash faults or ideally malicious and Byzantine faults, and what kind of timing assumptions they demand of the underlying communication network. Uh, so you, most of the protocols that uh, you recognize by their brand name, like Paxos and Raft, as well as PBFT, fall into the, uh, either they tolerate crash faults or Byzantine faults, but they rely on some form of synchrony assumption about the underlying communication network. Uh, so we know in theory that there are asynchronous protocols as well, but uh, I don't think any of you would be able to name a, a brand name system of a BFT protocol that falls in the asynchronous protocols category. Uh, so what I'm here to talk about is our protocol called Honey Badger BFT, which is the first practical asynchronous protocol to fill out that quadrant there. Uh, the theoretical contribution we had to do to make this protocol work is to improve the throughput uh, by a roughly n squared proportion compared to prior known work in asynchronous protocols for the batch setting, which is the, the appropriate setting for permission ledgers. And I'll tell you more about the protocol in a little bit. Uh, we also have an implementation of this available, so you can look at this in GitHub, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that more later, as well as um, experiments on wide-scale networks to show that this is practical. Um, before getting into the details of our protocol, I want to start by uh, trying to, to advocate in favor of asynchronous protocols in general. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to make this argument to you about why we should prefer asynchronous protocols. So to begin with, um, the, this uh, excitement about consensus protocols is due largely to the success of Bitcoin, and I think Bitcoin changes some of the way that we might think about what it takes to make a practical consensus protocol. Bitcoin isn't particularly fast or high throughput or, or low latency, uh, but the reason why it succeeded is because it really uh, uh, shows a lot of resilience under fairly challenging conditions. Um, this is why Bitcoin enthusiasts have called it the honey badger of money, because it appears not to be stoppable uh, even by highly motivated or, or uh, incentivized attackers. Uh, and if you don't know, honey badgers are these fearsome creatures that are very tough. They bite the heads off cobras and are immune to their venom. And uh, they, they basically, they can use tools to escape from their enclosures, so they can't be stopped. And so they're an appropriate mascot for the, the virtue of resilience or robustness. And um, to, to build you to get you into a good mood. I have this gift, you know, to make you uh, uh, happy and receptive to my argument about why we should prefer asynchronous protocols. So to give a little more uh, just clear description of what I mean by asynchronous, there's a spectrum of timing assumptions in distributed computing where the strongest assumption is full synchrony, and this is where we assume that every message between uncorrupted nodes in the network gets delivered within uh, a fixed amount of time delta, which is a protocol parameter you can depend on. 
Now, there are a bunch of weaker assumptions um, that are all sort of interchangeable, so I'm not going to go into great detail of them. You could think of them as cases where you, there is that bound, but you don't know what it is, or that bound may not hold at all times, or that bound may grow. And I say that these are in all interchangeable because uh, there are generic ways of transforming a protocol in any of these settings to, to also work in any of the other settings. So they're all essentially equivalent. And these are the categories where, where most of the well-known uh, consensus protocols lie within. And of course, the weakest assumption is the asynchronous assumption, which says that you can rely on all the messages between uncorrupted parties to be delivered, but there's no particular guarantee about how long it could be. It could be any amount of real time. You don't know. Um, this is clearly the most difficult setting, and so clearly the honey badger of uh, permission ledger BFT protocols should, uh, should work even in this uh, highly unconstrained environment. Uh, to build up to, to the next really practical argument, let me explain where the assumption about network synchrony manifests in the traditional BFT protocols, including PBFT and uh, all the, the rest of its ilk. So this is the general flow of a, of a BFT protocol. Uh, you always have at any given time an active leader. One of the nodes in the, the protocol is a leader. And you have a timeout parameter delta. And the basic idea is that there's a fast path that goes ahead and makes progress and commits some transactions when the current leader is one of the uncorrupted nodes and the network is delivering messages fast enough relative to delta, um, then, it, then it goes ahead and works. And this portion is called the fast path of the protocol. Now, if either of these assumptions isn't holding right now because the network isn't performing really well right now or delta is too small or the leader is bad, then after some timeout, you're going to go ahead and reelect a new leader. And, the, uh, and you're going to increase the timeout for the next uh, uh, round of this. And so you can see that these are going to kind of achieve the ideal guarantees and, and eventually make progress because eventually if you keep reelecting new leaders, you're going to have increased the timeout delta so that it's large enough relative to how the network's performing. And you're going to land on electing one of the, the uncorrupted nodes as the leader. Now, the problem is that uh, you have a parameter to tune. You have to choose some policy for how you choose this delta parameter or if you're going to increase delta, how you're going to adjust it. And so you have some conflicting goals in terms of how you choose this parameter. If you want to go fast, what you should do is make this parameter as small as you can based on how you think the network is going to form or you want to increase it very slowly. Uh, but the problem here is that if your assumption about the network or your estimate of the network is off, then you might have really poor performance. You'll have to keep re-electing new leaders even when good nodes are leaders or, uh, uh, or you may not make any progress at all if you have a very slow increase of, of delta or, or don't increase delta at all. On the other hand, if you make delta really large or if you make delta increase really quickly, then you introduce another problem which is that you may recover really slowly from even an intermittent network partition if when you snap back from a network partition and the partition's healed, the current leader or the next few leaders are corrupted nodes. Uh, the network may have healed, but you're still not going to be making any progress. All right, asynchronous protocols by their nature don't have any timeout parameters, and so you don't have this dilemma of parameters to tune, and if there's an intermittent network partition, as soon as the network comes back online, the protocol can begin making progress immediately. So this is really the most practical uh, argument in favor of asynchronous protocols. Uh, another argument that's more of a theoretical argument is that um, there is a, a separation, like an attack that you can do on, a, on weakly synchronous protocols where even an asynchronous protocol, where, where the weakly synchronous protocol won't make any progress at all for an indefinite amount of time, while an asynchronous protocol would make progress even at a reasonable throughput. And so it, it's kind of not surprising that if you have some protocols that rely on an assumption and then you, you violate that assumption, then the protocols don't work so well. Uh, but we went ahead and gave this explicit example example of what the attack is because we hadn't seen any uh, uh, constructive proof that that's the case uh, uh, to break those. And so the gist of it is if you want to, to break a weakly synchronous protocol while still making an asynchronous protocol make progress, um, you do two things. What you do is whenever a bad node is the leader, you go ahead and deliver messages as fast as, uh, as you care to for the rest of the nodes in the network. Uh, but when an honest node is the leader, you freeze the rest of the network or at least jam communications between the, the uh, current leader and the rest of the network. So this little chart shows um, you have different nodes. The adversary controls the node zero. That's the corrupted node. And so when the, the corrupted node's the leader, you go ahead and deliver messages really fast. This causes the network to elect a new leader. And then when one of the honest nodes is the leader, the network temporarily partitions the network, installs the messages. And this kind of pushes the network into a live lock uh, where it keeps going around and doesn't make any progress. But during the uh, times when the uh, corrupted node is the leader, you are delivering lots of messages 
changes really quickly, and so under those conditions, an asynchronous protocol would start to actually make progress. So let, let me explain a, a couple of explanations for why we don't hear about asynchronous protocols very much. So one that I run into is that um, most people in distributed systems know about the FLP result. This is one of the founding uh, theoretical results in distributed computing. And if you kind of squint and look at it, it seems to say that there's no such thing as an asynchronous protocol. You can't do it. But actually, the theorem is a lot more limited than that. It says that there are no deterministic asynchronous protocols. And so PBFT and the like are considered deterministic protocols and so you can't have just one of those and easily adapt it to, to fit this world. On the other hand, we know that there are randomized protocols that work fine, and uh, in a sense, you may say, well, you would prefer deterministic to random because random has some chance of failure, and that isn't really true because even the deterministic protocols rely on primitives like uh, authenticated channels, and in practice, those are only going to be implemented using cryptography anyway. So really, even the deterministic protocols are randomized too. However, although we know of randomized agreement protocols, these are thought to be impractical, uh, and so our protocol that we developed directly refutes this claim by, by presenting a randomized agreement protocol that is practical. So I said that there are, uh, I left the question mark there, but really there is, um, we only know of one example of a, of a full system that's implemented using randomized agreement protocols, and it goes back to 2002 by Christian Kashan and Portes, and it's called Sintra. And this is going to be our starting point because it is a, it, it, it's a, is a system complete implementation of randomized agreement, and so our approach is going to be to use this protocol as a starting point but improve on it. So what we're going to do is adapt this protocol, which essentially commits transactions one at a time, and we're going to adapt it so that it can efficiently commit a large batch or a block, if you will, of, of transactions at a time. And so to do this, we're going to have to improve the efficiency when we adapt it into this batch setting. Um, the first thing is we're going to refactor this protocol a bit, so we're going to mix and match a lot of existing primitives and, and fit them together uh, in ways that are going to improve on the performance but from when Sintra was produced, but still using existing primitives. And then we're going to strike off another linear factor by uh, a, new, uh, a new aspect of the protocol that allows us to do random selection, and we have to use threshold encryption to, to improve safety. So I'll describe the uh, these steps. So to begin with, I want to point out uh, one of the existing primitives that we're going to do some refactoring with, um, which isn't a, a new result. It's actually uh, by Stefano uh, Tassaro, who's here. So um, he remembers this, although he insists it was back when he was an undergrad that this uh, occurred. Um, and this is going to be a more efficient way of doing reliable broadcast. And I want to isolate this primitive because it's actually a really useful thing to know. I think this is an overlooked protocol, but you can use what I'm about to show you to even improve the performance of PBFT or, or the other protocols. So you can take this portion uh, uh, piecemeal. So the first step in PBFT and in, in this uh, primitive that we're going to use later, reliable broadcast, there's a standard way of doing it called Broca's broadcast. And the first step of this involves having a leader that wants to send uh, a batch of messages to all the rest of the nodes in the network. And so the leader goes ahead and does this. All right, but this introduces a, a bandwidth bottleneck because if the size of the, this block of transactions is B, like it contains B constant size transactions, then the leader's bandwidth cost here is N times B. So the more nodes you add, the more bandwidth the, the leader requires. And then to, in reliable broadcast, there are a couple of echo phases where the nodes send this block to each other, and so it, uh, it gets even worse than this. So to reduce this bottleneck, you can use this uh, uh, primitive from 2005. And the idea is that we're going to use erasure coding so that the leader no longer has to send the whole block to all of the nodes. Instead, uh, he prepares some erasure code, so different stripes, and then sends one stripe to each of the different nodes in the network. And then when the nodes receive their slice, they go ahead and send their slice to the rest of the other nodes. And so uh, the guarantee here that makes it reliable broadcast is every node is able to receive enough stripes of the erasure coding in order to uh, reconstruct the whole message, um, but no node has to send any anything more than uh, a, a network node independent uh, amount of bandwidth. So each node only has to contribute B bandwidth. I should also say that you also need to attach some Merkle tree authenticators to this. So the main part is erasure coding, but you also need um, a login uh, Merkle tree authenticator branch for each one of these messages. So you can use this trick to increase the performance of even some of the existing uh, uh, open source deployments of consensus protocols that I mentioned. This is a good step you can, you can uh, use in a portable way. 
So uh, now I'm gonna talk about uh, how our protocol works and again I'm gonna start by, uh, I'm not gonna go through the whole like, history and how this refactoring works, so I'm gonna kind of show like an inline uh, starting point which already involves replacing some of the, the initial Sintra protocol with, um, uh, uh, replacing it with um, replacing one subcomponent that's going to be inline just expanded here with a protocol from uh, the multi-party computation literature from 1994 um, and as well as a, that can be used to that relies on the, the broadcast primitive and then when it's instantiated with the efficient reliable broadcast that I just mentioned that can be efficient in large batches. So the setting here is that we have n nodes and each of the nodes is going to be receiving transactions submitted by clients and they're going to be storing these uncommitted transactions in the Buffer. And then w the beginning of the protocol is that each node selects a transaction from the front of their buffer and then provides that as input to one instance of reliable broadcast for each of the nodes. So each of the nodes is going to be the leader for its own broadcast protocol and it's going to try to broadcast the first transaction from its buffer. Now the, the trick with asynchronous broadcast is that you can't tell whether the broadcast, if you haven't seen the end of the broadcast protocol, you don't know whether it's going to finish and it's just an asynchronous network and so you haven't seen it finished yet or whether it's actually going to fail. And so in order to get a, a, a blockchain agreement out of this, you need to run a second phase of binary Byzantine agreements and basically the result of this is every one bit that you get from finishing all of the binary agreement protocols, those tell you which of the broadcasts you're going to include the, the result. So you first do the broadcast, then run n binary Byzantine agreements, and then once all of those finish, you know which messages from the broadcast contain transactions you're going to include in this block. And so you can take the vector of, um, of transactions that you've agreed on and then remove duplicates and maybe store them in some canonical order, and then that's going to be your block of transactions. All right, now the problem is that this is submitting one transaction at a time and even in this final vector you may have redundant transactions because if the nodes start off with similar buffers which could happen in the ordinary case because they're receiving transactions from you know, maybe the same clients in the network, this vector of, of uh, transactions you agree on might be highly redundant and so that's not so efficient. So uh, the obvious way to try to improve this is to have nodes not just propose one transaction at a time but to propose um, a bunch of them at a time and in order to eliminate the redundancy uh, you can have them select random elements from their buffer rather than just the, the, the first element at the end of their queue. Now this works except that uh, it introduces a problem which is that uh, the adversary is able to see uh, which transactions are being proposed by which nodes and the adversary in this asynchronous network model has the ability to selectively choose which nodes to suppress and so the adversary can choose some of the honest nodes and by manipulating the network prevent them from having their proposed transactions be the ones that are included in the final result. So if you're selecting transactions randomly and so at any given time only one node uh, is proposing each of the transactions. The adversary might be able to pick a transaction he doesn't want or he wants to censor and then prevent that transaction from ever getting committed. So to overcome this obstacle what we introduce is threshold encryption. So there's going to be a threshold encryption public key that's a shared key, it's like a public key for this whole group and each node at the beginning of its broadcast it's going to pick a random bunch of transactions to propose, encrypt all of those to the group's public key and then broadcast the ciphertext. And then when you get to the end of the binary Byzantine agreement phase what you're agreeing on is a set of ciphertext to include and so once all of the binary agreement protocols finish the, the ciphertext cipher texts are committed and everyone can agree on those, then the nodes run the threshold decryption procedure so that they work together and they'll be able to decrypt what those cipher texts are. And uh, uh, they'll all be able to agree on what the, the output of those because the, the decryption stage is deterministic. Um, but the key idea is that uh, you're guaranteed that you can, that you can decrypt the cipher texts at the end but only with the participation of some of the honest nodes. And so all of the cipher texts that are going to be included are committed before any of the nodes begin decrypting them so the adversary has no way to tell which nodes have proposed which transactions so this prevents uh, any sort of selective censorship attack. Uh, the upshot of this is that uh, using this new protocol we're able to claim optimal resilience meaning we can tolerate um, up to a third of corrupted nodes and we get optimal efficiency in the sense that if we choose the batch size large enough and the batch size does have to be large you end up with um, essentially a quadratic necessary batch size uh, in order to get this result but for a large batch size we're able to achieve constant efficiency so you can add more nodes and you aren't increasing scalability but you also aren't increasing the amount of bandwidth that's needed for each node. 
And intuitively, the reason why is that the, the broadcast phase only depends on the size of the batch, not on the number of nodes. And then the binary agreement phases are you know, maybe quadratic uh, in the number of nodes, but they don't depend on the batch size. So once you have a large enough batch size, the, the cost of um, the, the efficient broadcast dominates compared to the, the you know, effectively constant uh, amount of work needed for the, the binary agreement protocols. And uh, I could also say that in terms of the number of rounds that this takes, uh, it's log n, but in practice that the number of rounds isn't critical for latency, really the, the bandwidth requirement is what affects latency if you're bandwidth constrained, and so it's still going to be constant performance assuming each node contributes the same amount of bandwidth, or it'll be the, whatever's the lowest common denominator there. And um, I haven't given you any formal definitions about the, the problem statement. It's technically called atomic broadcast. That's the old name for blockchain protocol. Um, but our proofs and formal definitions are in the paper. So let me tell you a little bit about our implementation. So this is available online now. Um, this is a Python uh, implementation. We use gevent for our concurrency layer. And we rely on threshold cryptography for a couple of parts, not just for the threshold encryption at the end, but also the binary agreement phase requires uh, threshold signatures as well. And so for this, we use the charm wrapper for uh, pairing-based crypto in Python. And the back end for that is the pairing-based crypto library from Stanford. And uh, there are more details in the paper about what are the threshold encryptions and signature schemes that we use. As far as we know, these are the first available implementations of these, so you may want to borrow these threshold signature and encryption implementations for your own use. Uh, you can just borrow them from our online code. And we also have uh, a Docker file that you can use to reproduce our experiments, and that helps installing some of the dependencies. So let me tell you about our first experiment, which is a wide area network using EC2. Um, I guess I, I didn't realize that Loy's experiment went up to 1,600 nodes. That's pretty impressive. Uh, when I saw this compared to the first preprint, we still beat them in terms of the size of, uh, of, uh, of the nodes, but um, not anymore. But regardless, um, you know, this year we've seen new breakthroughs in terms of how large you can run BFT protocols. Typically, they've been much smaller than this in terms of the network sizes. So we also use um, nodes spread across eight different EC2 regions, and so five continents in total. And this chart is showing the, the trade-off between throughput and latency that we get. So on the left side, you see what the latency of the protocol is when you have a very small batch side, and so the time for the binary agreement protocols is what dominates the cost. And so sure enough, if you have a small batch size, the larger of a network you have, the, the, the slower it goes, and you don't get very good throughput either. But if you increase the batch size large enough, then, like I said, the, 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 uh, the broadcast phase dominates. And so if you have a larger and larger batch size, you can essentially achieve constant throughput regardless of what the network sizes, although it becomes, you have to have a sort of implausibly large batch size to reach that kind of, uh, uh, you know, level off point in order to get this top throughput. Uh, regardless, what we're able to show in our experiment is that with a medium-sized network at least, so over 56 nodes, we're still able to produce 10,000 transactions per second. Right, and if we were able to stand, extend the batch size large enough, we would be able to uh, reach the same bandwidth uh, regardless of the network, uh, regardless of the network size. Now, uh, I'm also proud to talk about um, another experiment that we did, which is I think this is the first time that anyone's ever tried to run a BFT protocol over Tor. And we're really able to do this because Tor introduces a lot more latency than you typically find in a, in a BFT protocol experiment. And we actually ran our, our protocol on top of Tor without having any parameters to tune because there just aren't any parameters to tune in the protocol. So it's the exact same protocol configuration as for our EC2 experiments. And what we did is set up a node that makes some um, hidden service connections to itself. So so it's going out to a random rendezvous point in the network and then back to itself. So it's still one node, but still we end up with n-squared uh, hidden service circuits through the Tor network. And uh, we experimented with still a smaller number of nodes, and the latency is a lot worse, and the achievable throughput's a lot worse in Tor. But we were still able to run our protocol and achieve over 1,000 transactions per second uh, over the Tor network. So we think this is an unprecedented result, and it's a good virtue of the asynchronous protocol that we don't have to really worry about what the conditions of the network are, if there's variable latency, the protocol will work as is and make progress at whatever throughput the network allows without having to worry about its exact timing performance. 
just to wrap up, I want to just mention a couple of deployment scenarios for this protocol. So our initial target is to build a drop-in replacement that everyone who's building some blockchain framework can use. They can replace their uh, uh, shoddy old PBFT with our shiny new Honey Badger protocol. It can be a drop-in replacement for um, these frameworks like um, Hyperledger that have like a consensus protocol module. You can put Honey Badger in as your consensus module. And as we saw in the last talk, there are a bunch of other things you can do, even in not the permissioned ledger setting, even in the open ledger setting, you can have a hybrid consensus protocol where you choose your identities using an open proof of work protocol. And I, I think Lloyd said that he uses PBFT as his core consensus module. Well, if you wanted to eliminate the, the timing assumption, at least for the, once you've selected the identities for, for what you do after that, you could use uh, Honey Badger as a drop-in replacement there. Similarly, there's a bunch of proof of stake protocol proposals in the cryptocurrency world, and these also rely on some consensus module, and so this could be an attractive uh, uh, module to put there. And finally, there's a lot of work in how to compose consensus protocols from other consensus protocols where essentially you would fall back. If one protocol fails, you would fall back to another. So a natural choice would be to have a fast path protocol that when it starts not to, to work well, it falls back to Honey Badger as the protocol of last resort. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. Uh, happy to take questions. So thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Um, you seem to imply that Leader is part of the package of BFT protocols. Yes. Are you aware of uh, symmetric, asynchronous consensus protocols or BFT protocols? Because they actually are pretty efficient because they don't suffer this kind of attack. They don't have a Leader to be so attacked. Symmetric ones? Do you, uh, symmetric, do you... leaderless protocols. There are, there are some in, in the literature. We can take it offline. But actually, they, they would escape this problem that you're focusing. My second question is probably more related to your work. Are you aware of this RITAS protocol? Sorry, say again? RITAS, R-I-T-A-S, because you know, it's, it's uh, some years ago, and actually they were tracking these lines of, of your paper, and they were coming up with a very efficient, randomized solution for a synchronous BFT. They actually compare very favorably with uh, Sintra, so I wonder uh, if This is called RITAS? RITAS. Okay, I'm not a... Yeah. I'm not aware of it. I'm definitely very interested okay, in that. Good. So, um, yeah, sure. and, and you, you, the symmetric ones that you mentioned, um, yeah. these are in the we, asynchronous yeah. setting as well? Yeah, yeah, they are, they are, yes. Okay. Um, I'm not aware of those. I did oh. the best that I could yeah. find, but we'll I'm very it. interested to, to, we'll to hear what you have in mind. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm Yao Xi from National University, uh, National University of Singapore. Uh, right. This is a very nice talk, so I have two questions. Sure. Uh, so for the first one, you use the uh, um, binary Byzantine agreement. So for that one, do you need uh, the random beacon to generate uh, the common random number? Uh, we. I'm not sure whether, yeah, we, so especially for the binary agreement protocol, right. um, that's already made primitive, but it relies on a common coin that's effectively a random beacon, and we implement that using these pairing-based unique uh, threshold signatures. So we get a random beacon from our end nodes already uh, by using this threshold signature scheme. Okay, I see. And the, uh, the second question that I just, so for your evaluation, so if the Byzantine nodes really behave maliciously, so will they affect uh, your performance, like the latency will delay your protocol very much? Or not? I, I don't think so. That's a drawback of the implementation that I have here. So we really should add to our Docker file now a way of simulating um, crashes. Um, what I would say, though, is that there isn't, any, there isn't any fast path and then fallback phase. So if any nodes do anything wrong, it, it would be just the same as if they uh, uh, crashed or delayed, or in other words, the, the, the protocol is going to proceed whenever the N minus F nodes uh, finish their portion of the work, but it's entirely symmetric, so there isn't any um, like kind of side path that's going to cause some kind of different messaging pattern. The messaging pattern between the nodes is the same regardless of what any of the corrupted nodes do. So I wouldn't affect, it, it, the, the worst that it could do is make it go to the slowest N minus F nodes rather than maybe the, the fastest nodes, including the, the adversary. But I don't have any um, implementation results with crashed nodes to, to, to show that. I see. Okay, thank you. Hey. So in your protocol, I see that you encrypt your transactions mm -hmm. and agree and then decrypt. Yes. So what if you agree on two double spend transactions? Do you throw it 
both out? R right. So you, what you agree on is the set of transactions to include and a canonical ordering. And so you can simply, at the point that you've agreed on this canonical ordering, you can ignore double spends kind of at the application layer from that list. So there is a total ordering of every transaction. Actually. There is a global ordered log of the transactions. And so you can kick out the double spends at that point. Or you can do what Ethereum is and maybe take their gas, you know, take their transaction fee, but not commit their, their double spend uh, you know, semantic effect. Uh, hi, I want to ask, uh, what's the original of doing the experiment over Tor? Does it introduce any asynchronous? Yeah, so Tor has fairly highly variable latency. It really depends on what your random circuits are that you choose. Um, so it increases the latency and it increases the variability of the latency. And, you know, it could also vary depending on the weather, you know, in the network. So uh, that's what makes it more difficult. I don't know if this was a part of your question, but um, I feel like talking about it, why would you want to run anything over Tor? I think that a compelling use case for, for Tor is that if you want to have a really robust network, one of the ways to do that is to have the nodes in the Honey Badger BFT protocol stay hidden behind, you know, if they were actually run as hidden services, then you wouldn't know where the nodes are. And so you might have a harder time attacking the nodes if they're hidden behind Tor. But your target is a permissioned uh, blockchain, right? Yes. Uh, permission, permission blockchain that everyone should reveal their identity, right? You, you may reveal what your public key is. You may even reveal your identity, but you don't necessarily need to know where your data center is, where you're running your node. So you can still get some practical, private, practical robustness by hiding the physical location of your node. Okay, thanks. So I have a question. Sure. So uh, you need really full buffers to have the n squared, what was the number? Left? Yeah, n squared login. login. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, there it was. Okay. So you have to have really full buffers. So I think in your paper you say you have to be in a setting where transactions are coming in fast enough to keep yeah. your buffers really full. But, I mean, standard queuing theory, if your buffers are always full, then they're unbounded, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can't balance it exactly. So yeah. if your buffers are always full, then in fact your buffers are growing <laughs> and you're just going to lose. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Um, I would say if your buffers start to fill up, you could always hot swap and plug in more storage to accommodate that. So uh, you, know, you could conceivably, <laughs> if you're running out of you know, practical queue size and you need it because there just aren't transactions being committed nearly as fast as they're coming in, um, y yeah, you would have to either... But increasing the queue size doesn't help, right? It just will make the transactions have an... A very long unbounded time unbounded delay. That's true. You would have unbounded delay in the yeah. time that it takes to commit. I think that's inherent with a, with a full asynchronous protocol. Right. But yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Let's thank the speaker again. And let's thank all the speakers for the session.